Um, if you are with us online, I'm uh, sorry, we've been having some trouble. I don't know if you can hear me still or not. Uh, we've been having trouble with our sound. They've been working on it. And um, uh, if there is no sound, that's probably the best message you've ever heard me preach. So uh, it would be good. So um, isn't it great to be uh, chosen? Don't you like to be chosen? Right? Nobody wants to be chosen last. Right? Nobody, we, we love to be chosen, right? Like, if you remember, like, out on the playground or whatever, um, and, you know, they're choosing up sides. It was really um, funny to me that, uh, a few months ago. Um, I was never, like, the best athlete, uh, but I was always athletic. I mean, I, you know, I could always, you know, pretty much compete at just about anything. Uh, not the best, but I could always hold my own. And a few weeks ago, it was back was several months ago now, some young adults get together and play volleyball on Tuesday nights. And I went over, and they were dividing up teams, and I'm like, they're, they're kicking everybody, and I'm still standing. That, that's never really happened to me, right? I've not finally reached that age, probably a long time ago, but where I'm just not, I'm not the first chosen. I'm not even, I'm the last one. Okay, I guess we'll take Darren, you know. Uh, so, because uh, he's the only one last, so we'll take him. But we, you know, we, we like to be chosen, right? It's good to be, it feels good to be chosen. Now, I'm going to show you a picture. Actually, Courtney's going to show you a picture. Um, and please, just bear in mind. <laughs> thank you for doing it so quickly. Uh, so, this was my senior prom. Uh, you can see how excited I was. Uh, this, the, by the way, this is me and the, the only one. That, I guess the rest of the guys didn't get the memo. It was supposed to be a uh, silver tux. I don't, I don't know why I had a silver tux on. Uh, I was, uh, obviously this guy was the king because he's wearing the crown. But I was uh, selected as the runner-up. I was chosen as the runner-up to the king. Now, where are these other two guys? Like one was the second runner-up and maybe they, I don't know. But um, for some reason we got out of order. And these were not our dates. They were just... In fact, uh, these two are brother and sister, so um, uh, they weren't dates. Um, but that, of course, would nor would they could have been. But um, uh, anyways, that so it, it was it was kind of it was kind of awkward, but it was kind of cool to be chosen. You know, you chosen by your peers or whatever. And that this was like thirty two years ago. That just that just blows my mind. Thirty two years ago. So. Um, uh, what? Uh, yeah, but uh, yours was 33 years ago. So, um, uh, you can please go ahead and move, move past it. Thank you. Uh, enough of that. Um, so, it, we've talked about, last few weeks we've talked about, we've been on this, this topic of being rooted in God's Word. We, we're walking through the book of, of Colossians, and we're talking about what it means to be rooted in, and really we, we've taken it from the context of chapter 2, I don't know if this is going to be on there, but yeah, there you go. Chapter 2, verse 6 and 7. Here's what Paul writes. Um, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus and the Lord, so walk in him. Then verse 7 says, rooted and built up. So as you receive Christ, walk in him. And the way that we walk in him is we are rooted in him and in his word. We have to be firmly planted. We have to be knowledgeable, not because we have to know everything. Because listen, I, like I said, I've, I've been around a lot longer than all of you in this room, and I don't know everything in this scripture. I, I don't know everything in this book. You're not going to know everything. You're not going to understand everything. That's part of the inspiration of God's word. But the, the closer we are in a relationship with him, the more rooted we become, we need to become in his word, so that when we have situations that have come in our lives, it doesn't mean that difficulty won't come, and it doesn't mean that we won't even make poor choices, but it will keep us from making some choices that we would have made otherwise, and we'll get to some of that tonight. So um, we, we've looked last couple of weeks of how we should be rooted and, and some of the benefits of being rooted in God's Word, what it brings in our lives. Uh, last week, in the first part of chapter 3, we looked at the desires and the cravings that we have as, as just human beings, our sinful natures. Um, and, and so, and, and the last part we looked at last week was some of those things that we are to, that, you know, Paul writes that we are to, to, to kill, uh, they put to death, and, I, and we use the word slay. We're to slay these things. And, and he lists them out, these, these earthly desires or fleshly desires. We just 
We, and he lists them out. We didn't read all of those, but but that, those are things we just need to slay. Well, tonight we're going to take a different direction, and we're going to look at things because Scripture tonight tells us that we're chosen by God. Now, let me just be, be, uh, hopefully be clear here. I believe, and you know this about me, I've said if you've been at all, you know this about me, I believe that Jesus desires a relationship with every single person who was ever created. I do not believe that every person will accept him as their Savior. Okay? I believe that's his desire. I believe John 3.16 and even John 3.17 are very clear that he came to save and he didn't come to condemn, he came to to rescue those that are lost. He came to redeem those that are lost. And, and we're all lost. So I believe that Jesus came, his, his, the sacrifice he's made is, is good enough for the entire world to know him. But I think God in his sovereignty knows that he's given us free will, right? So we can accept him or, or, or not. And I believe God knows, but he hasn't given us that knowledge. So that's why Jesus tells us as, as part of the Great Commission, to go out and just to go, make disciples of all nations, to, to witness, to share our faith. We have to do that. We're called to do that. We're commanded to do that if you have a relationship with Christ. But he says that he uses the word chosen here. We have to realize we don't, we don't choose Christ. He chooses us. Listen to what Paul says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. But we all always thanks God, thanks for God, brother, beloved the Lord, because God chose you. I know I stumbled through most of all of that, but that's okay. The main part is God chose you. Now, again, we have to be careful not to take Scripture out of context because this, this was a, a letter that Paul wrote to the, the, the people in the, the church in Thessalonica. It wasn't, I mean, we weren't around back then, but listen, these are some promises that we can claim as our own as well. They're truths for us. They weren't written to us, but they're, they're, they're promises and truths and commands for us. So I do believe that God chooses us. We just accept his free gift of salvation. And Paul will use that language here tonight as we look. Uh, if, if we are chosen and we are rooted in the word of God, we are rooted in the person of Christ and we are rooted in his word, then we'll see he uses those words tonight. So uh, chapter 3, verse 12, and I'm going to read 12 through 17. It'll be on the board here for you. As well, or on the TV, it's not really on the board. I, don't know why. I always call it a board. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's because I'm old and you know, yes. it's a flannel board or something. We're going to stick things on it. You don't even know what flannel boards are. But, anyways, here, here's what he says. Here's what the word of God says. He says, put, um, put on the. Now, remember, last week we finished up with these are things that you need to get rid of. These now are things that we need to put on. So, put on the since. You have a relationship with God. Put on then as God's chosen ones. He's chosen you. He, if we have a relationship with Christ, He has chosen us. Isn't it great to, I, I was talking with the band and the volunteers earlier, and I said, you know, I, I don't even know what word to use there to realize that the God, the creator of all that there is, the creator of all the universe, has chosen somebody like me. Not to just do this, this is even blows my mind even more, but just has chosen that he desires a relationship with me. I don't even like, I don't even know if I want to have a relationship with me. But God does. It, and he does with you too. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility. See, these are the things we, we put to death, those other things, even the things that we put on. A kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another. And if you have, if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other as the Lord has forgiven you, so also you must forgive. Verse 14, and above all these things, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in richly teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs 
with thanks, uh, thankfulness in your, in, in your hearts to God. In the last verse, and whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, giving thanks to God the Father. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your word. I pray that you will open our eyes, our ears, our hearts, <coughs> reveal something new to us or something that we just, maybe we have forgotten, maybe we have neglected. Just, just Father, just reveal something to us tonight. We, we are your servants. We long to hear a fresh word from you. Not from you, from you. Lord, I ask these things in your name. Amen. So, as chosen ones, as, as we are to live this new life, and we'll get to that in just a second, he says, you know, we're, we're, we're to put on, so we're chosen, as chosen, living this new life. First thing, by the way, we're going to be extra, um, I don't know if everybody in the room is Baptist, but we're going to be extra Baptist now. I have four <laughs> points uh, instead of three. I don't have a poem, but I do have four points, so uh, I'll get through them quick, I promise so number one is he says, and look look at verse uh, twelve and fourteen through fourteen. He says we should our dress should reflect it. If we have a relationship with Christ, if we have this new life, now listen, I'm not talking about the clothes you wear necessarily. That's not it. It's what you put on. He says, so put on then this humility, patience, love. So you get what I'm saying. It's not the outward clothing, but it will be the outward appearance that others will see in you. Listen. He said, remember, we, we talked about these things, and he, and he gives us this portrait of what a Christ follower should clothe himself with, this compassion, kindness, gentleness, humility, patience, bearing with each other. Let me ask you and ask myself, how are we doing with those? I, I do pretty good with a couple of them. Then there's a couple others that I don't do well at all with. You can ask anybody that knows me well. I really struggle with some of those areas. But it's not that we're going to ever do this perfectly, but those are what we strive to do. Those are things that we, we pray that God would just give us the, the extra grace that we need to, to live this, to show patience, to show love. And he, listen, he says, you know, in Scripture he talks about that, you know, we're, we're to, to forgive one another and carry each other's burdens because they're deserving. No, he didn't say they're deserving. We're just supposed to love them. That's hard to do, isn't it? When someone, I, I, I'm not really too uh, upset when people wrong me or you know, I haven't really been wrong that much in my life. I, I, I've been wrong plenty of times, but I mean, I haven't been treated poorly many times in my life. But I'm okay. I, you know, I get over that. I'm all right with that. But if, when somebody does something or says something about my family or to my family, that, that kind of gets under my skin a little bit. And, and, you know, I think it's kind of a righteous anger. You know, maybe I justify myself with that. I don't know. But in other words, in the scripture, we should forgive others. And, and if we look further in Scripture, because Christ forgave us, we should then forgive others. It should be evident in your life. We sing of that. The evidence of Christ in our lives. Is it evident in your life? Is it evident that you desire and you're, you're, you're pushing forward, you're, you're rooted in God's Word, and that's having an influence in your life? Is that evident to other believers? Now listen, there are other people. Now that's not all, it's not all about the act, it's not all about showing, but it, it's about being. Remember I've said time and time again, and this is not unique to me, I, I borrowed this from another preacher who's, who's much more eloquent in what he says than I say, but he it flow doing. It's not about doing, but doing always flows from being. When we are in the Word of Christ, then the Word of Christ will flow from us. When we are rooted in God and in His Word, that will flow from us. That's how it works. It's not about doing more. It's about being more. Look, at, look with me at Ephesians chapter 4. We'll read a couple of verses here. Uh, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 20 through 24. 
Now this Paul is writing here about living the new life. He just talks about, um, just finishes talking about getting rid of some of these, these other things. And he's talked here about putting off the old self. Listen, he says, but that is not the way you learn Christ. He's, he's talking about these people who've learned Christ this other way and, and, and they look this other way. But he says, this is not how you've learned Christ. Assuming that you have heard about him and were taught in him as the truth is in Jesus to put off the old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires and to be renewed in the spirit of, of your minds and to put on the new self created after the likeness of God and, and right the true righteousness and holiness. So we once lived this way. Before we had the relationship with Christ, now we must live something, we must live different. Why? Because we're better? No, because we're forgiven. And we are we are wretched, simple creatures, just like those that don't know Christ. But we know Christ. There should be something, there has to be something different in our lives. But Christ isn't making a difference. We're not allowing Christ to make a difference. I, I used to, in student ministry, and I still have to remind myself this sometimes, because I, I get... I get, uh, anyways, I get frustrated, but uh, sometimes, you know, when, when we would have, you know, teenagers that would come, and, and they, they were completely unchurched. They never, you know, they, they came to, you know, see a girl or a boy or whatever, which is fine. That's why we, you know, we want anything we can do to get them in, that's fine. Well, that anything, but you know what I mean. <laughs> so, uh, but, you know, and, and some of our youth volunteers would say, you know, they'd get on to them because they weren't really... And I'm like, look, and, and, and listen, I, don't, I didn't always have these moments of wisdom. I, I don't always have moments of wisdom, trust me. But I would say, you know what? We can't expect a lost person to act like a Christian. Now, that doesn't give us the excuse to just let them just terrorize and destroy the building. Okay, I get that. But we're lost. They don't, they don't know Jesus. They don't know how to act. They don't, they, they don't have that, that knowledge yet. They don't have, it's not knowledge, they don't have that in them yet. We have to give a little grace there. And I know there's a fine line. I mean, I, I get that. Because it gets frustrating at times. And I have to remind myself, you know, they're just, they're just acting like a lost person. What really is frustrating is when we if those of us that have a relationship with Christ, we act like us. What message are we sending to them? We're not showing much evidence, are we? And I can say we, trust me. I'm saying we. It's not just about you. It's about me. But Paul says when we have a relationship with Christ, the old is gone, the new has come. 2 Corinthians 5, 17, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. That old person is gone. new has come. If you genuinely have a relationship with Christ, others will see it. There will be a difference. Secondly, when we are chosen, when we have this new life, peace, the peace of God should guide us. Look what he says in verse 15. He says, and, um, and the, let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts. We, we, I don't know if you know this about me, but I tend to be a moody person. Don't, don't say anything that's too bad. I, I see you guys. Uh, I tend to be very moody. That's just, that's, I, I do. I, I'm not, you know, I'm not making jokes about that. I just, I do. I tend to be a little moody at times, sometimes more than others. I don't know why, but um, that, that's not really showing peace. We're either going to live by peace or we're going to live by hatred. We're going to let peace rule in our heart or disgruntledness and hatred rule in our heart. And he says here, the peace should rule, the peace of Christ rule in our hearts because this is what we were called and in the body. This is what we were called to do in the body of Christ. I, I'm not sure why, but listen, the peace of Christ, one of my favorite verses, you know this, four, Philippians 4, 7, says, let the peace and the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, which means, and I've told you this before, you're going to go through situations in your life, circumstances in your life, that in no way should bring you peace. It just shouldn't. 
So when it means that the peace of God, what you won't understand, means if you are rooted in God's word, not everything will go well. You'll have difficulty. But if you are rooted in God's word, you can find peace even in the midst of chaos. And you won't be able to understand it. You won't. Other than to say, I don't, I don't know. Christ is just is giving me peace for some reason. The peace of God, which you may not understand at the time, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. The peace of God that we can have only through a relationship with Him. We can have peace in situations and circumstances that are crazy because when we have a relationship where we are truly rooted in God and His Word, our circumstances will not dictate our peace. Our peace will be dictated by the fact that we have a relationship with Christ. And because our circumstances, and you know this as well as I do, even though you haven't lived as long, you know this as long, well as I do, your circumstances and your situations change daily, don't they? A year ago, how many of you thought we'd be locked down because of COVID? Well, maybe not. Yeah, about a year ago. We were, everything was pretty normal last January, right? It's whatever normal is anymore. It's changed, right? And, and there's been a lot of, of difficulty. I mean, not just financial. Not, I mean, that's people that own small businesses and, you know, people have lost jobs. I get that. And I'm not even talking about that. Look at the emotional and mental stress that it put on so many people. I was talking to um, a lady today. Uh, um, what's the piano? Uh, Kate. She's a, a nurse practitioner or physician's assistant at the hospital, and, and she's kind of over that ward where uh, there's a lot of COVID patients. And I, and I just said, man, I'm, I'm praying for you. I, I have no idea. I, I have empathy, which means I, 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 I can't have sympathy because I don't know what you're going through. But I empathize with you. See, you know, it's, just, it's gotta be stress. It's, it's the max. She sees it every day. And it's not just her. I mean, they, look, oh, they see it every day. It's been crazy. But even in the midst of those circumstances, and I am not making light of that at all, we can have peace only through a relationship with Christ and being rooted in His Word. Number three, we can have peace and be chosen because the Word of God should fill us. Look at verse 16. He says, um, uh, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching you and admonishing one another. That the word of Christ dwell in you richly. To dwell means that it is to remain and, and to live. Richly means basically it's just abundantly. It means to live inside of you abundantly. Listen, I, I, I say this a lot to you, I know, but I, I couldn't tell you how many Bibles I know. I have a whole couple of shelves full of Bibles. And you know how good they do me sitting there? They don't do me a bit of good. And the Bible that you own, if you own a Bible, if you don't own a Bible, please let me know. We will get you a Bible. But the Bible or Bibles that you own, if they're just sitting there, they will not do you any good. We have to spend time in God's Word. We have to dig into God's Word and, and his word will reside, if it resides in us, it will fill us and it will guide us. It's our manual, it's our, it's our guide. It's so much more than even that. I, I, that's not even a good word for it. It is God's holy, anointed, infallible, which means there are no errors in God's word. And, and now we have, there, there is no, there's no excuse we have so many options of, of reading God's Word on your phone, on your tablet, on wherever. We have no excuse. And listen, I, I was, I, I think I told you a couple weeks ago, I was really convicted of this. And this past year, um, I, I really started to just, the last two years, I, for several years in a row, I, I read through God's Word. Um, I read through the Bible for a couple of years. I did a reading plan and read through the Bible and all that. And, and uh, I did it a couple of years in a row, two or three years in a row. And then I took a couple of years off, not, not like off from reading the Bible completely, but 
I didn't read it for my own my own learning, my own study. And that, I just I, I became really convicted about that. I, I thought, how could I teach you or anyone else about the importance of God's word when it wasn't really even important in my life? At least I wasn't showing it to be important. So I've been I've, I've just had a, this new passion for God's word. And and listen, I'm not a scholar. I'm a student. But I'm just digging into God's word. I'm diving into God's word. Because it, it guides us. But it won't do anything if we don't dig into it. Several years ago, I probably have told you the stories no more. And I say the same stories over and over again. Um, I've lived a kind of boring life, I guess. I'm very vanilla. Very vanilla. Um, but anybody here have a CDL license? Commercial, if you don't know what that means, commercial driver's license. Nobody's oh, good. Okay. Why don't you? I, I don't have one. I know what it is. I know what it is. Why would you have nothing? Um, so, remember. several years ago, I worked for um, this is before I went to ministry. This is before I started teaching school. Those of you who didn't know, I taught school for a while, too. Uh, and uh, I was a really good PE teacher. Um, but, uh, okay. uh, yeah. So, I, I worked for an Exxon distributor. And uh, we drove. You know, obviously drove a truck full of, you know, a bomb, basically, I mean, full of gas, right? So uh, a couple thousand gallons of gas and things like that. But uh, so I had to have a CDO, I had to have a commercial drive license to drive one of the trucks. And uh, so I, I went to the, you know, the, the whatever, the driver testing training, and the first part was the, the computerized test, and then you're supposed to take the driving test. I wasn't worried about the driving test because I had driven the trucks. But um, online, I had driven the trucks a few times illegally, but I had driven them because people were out, you know, farmers were out of gas and they needed gas, so I had to adopt the one there. So I go take this uh, computer test, and, and you know, I didn't read the manual, they gave me a manual. I'm like, oh, I didn't read driving a truck, right? I mean, I, I, you know, I, I've done this since I'm 16. So I go to the test, and I'm done in like, it's on all on the computer, and I'm done in like 20 minutes. Tops. I'm like, sweet. This wasn't hard at all. <laughs> So I go to get my results, and and uh, basically it was 20 minutes because I I missed everything. I bombed it. I mean, and so when you miss a certain amount, it just locks you out. The computer shuts down, and you're done. You know, you can't. So uh, I, I totally bombed because I didn't study. I didn't read the manual. Listen, if we don't read and study God's word, it's not going to have any influence in our lives. Psalm 119, 11 says, I've hidden your word in my heart so that I might not sin against you. I've hidden your word. That means you have dug and you dwell in the word. It is resting in you. You are in digging into God's word. God's word is a guide to us to keep us from the evil one. Who Peter says is always on the ground. Always on the ground. Hebrews chapter 4, the writer tells us that uh, the Word of God is, is living and active. It's living. It's active today, and it's sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing the vision of soul and spirit and joints of marrow and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. The Word of God is living and active. And for us to be rooted in our relationship with Christ the way that we have to be, the way that we need to be, we have to be in God's Word. Last point, number four. Go to read through this pretty quick. Number four, if you are chosen, you are living this new life, the Word of God causes us to reflect the glory of God. Look at what he says in verse 17. And whatever you do, whatever. You may think, well, I just, you know, I work, you know, I just work at a job. It doesn't matter. Whatever you do, it doesn't tell you what to do. He doesn't, he doesn't tell you where to go. He just says, whatever you do, in, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Whatever you do, give thanks and glorify Him. Paul doesn't tell you what to do. That's not the point. We all have different gifts. We all have different passions. All of you are not going to be up on the stage leading worship. All of you are not going to be standing here preaching. 
That, that's not, you know, I'm not going to be doing what you do because I don't have that gift. And that's okay. But what is it that you have? What is it that you do that God uniquely created you to do that will bring glory to him? You do that to bring glory to him. Whatever you do, you do it in the name of Jesus. Why? So others will see you? No. So others will see Christ in us. I'm not one of those guys that wear like, you know, these flamboyant like uh, Christian t-shirts, you know, and, and just you know, turn and burn type of stuff. I, I, don't, I don't do that. I don't know, turn around and watch that turn around. I don't wear those shirts. Uh, I think James has one, but I don't, I don't wear those shirts. But, but, you know, it doesn't matter because it shouldn't have to be that. They should see just how we behave and how we act, how we live our lives. Not because you're perfect, because not one person in this room is perfect. And if someone expects you to be perfect, then they're wrong. They're wrong. You can't be. Because you were sin just you were built, born, and sin just like I was. But you're called to be light. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 10 31, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, you need to be born. Whatever you do. Whatever you do. The glory of God. I want to read you one last verse out of the book of Matthew. I love this passage. This is part of the Sermon on the Mount. Um, it's the longest recorded message, really, I guess, that we have from Jesus. It takes up Matthew 5, 6, and 7. And this is right in the middle of it, uh, or right at the beginning, really. But he talks about how we are to be the light of the world. Listen to this, verse 14, chapter 5, verse 14. You are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. I, I refer to this quite a bit, I know. Verse 15, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but they put it on a stand and it gives light to all on the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good deeds. They'll see the good deeds that you do. And that's, that's okay. They'll see your good deeds or your good works. But they'll give glory to the Father who is in heaven. You see, that's what it's all about. And, and, and basically, in verse four, if Christ really lives in us, if he genuinely lives in us, if we genuinely have a relationship with Christ, it says here that it has to be seen. That this is terrible grammar, and I say this every week. Terrible grammar. It can't not be seen. Basically. If Jesus lives in you, other people have to see him. If they don't see it, listen, I'm not here to question your salvation, but if they don't see it, then we, may, we may have to reevaluate that. We may have to reevaluate. Is there, is there really a relationship here? And that is not to cast doubt. But I don't want anybody to leave here thinking that they have a relationship with Christ and they really don't. Mm -hmm. Because it's just no fruit. Not because you're not perfect, but there's no fruit. You may be called to be a missionary, and that's fine. Uh, like in a vocational, we're all called to be missionaries. But I'm like, you know, you're not maybe not be called to go to a mid foreign land or another place to, you know, start it or whatever. I don't know what God is calling you to do, but He's calling you to do something, and He's calling you to do something good for your good and for His glory. So let me ask you this as we close: a couple questions. And when I say dress, remember that's not the clothes that you're wearing on the outside. That is your spiritual clothing, that spiritual armor, basically, that we talk about. Does my, you put this in the first person. You don't, you can write this on the card if you want, or you can just, just, you know, just keep it in your head or answer it in your mind, whatever you want to do. Does my dress reflect relationship with God? Does do my actions, the way that I behave, 
Does it reflect that I have a relationship with Christ? No, I'm not perfect. No, I'm not always going to make good choices. I'm, I'm going to mess up. I'm going to give in to temptation. Yes, we all know that. We all do. I'm talking about a normal way of living. Does my dress reflect the fact that I have a relationship with Christ? It should. According to Paul, it should. According to Jesus, who I'm a pretty good expert on the fact. And then the second question. This is just for you to respond and for you to just take from here. And this is what I want. This is what I want you to know. Okay? If, let me just put it in these words for you. This is what I feel like I want you to know. And this is what I want us to do. That makes sense? I want you to know this. I do this when I'm, when I'm, when I'm preaching. I, when I go into a passage, I have these two questions in mind. That what I want them to know from this passage is what I want them to do. Not just them, but all of us. But So I want you to know this, but then this is what we want to do. I will say this to yourself. You don't have to say this out loud. Just to yourself. I will be rooted in God's word so that I can better bring glory to Him. Let me tell you, that does not just happen. It has to be an intentional effort. And, and if you're anything like me, I have this this reading plan I'm doing now in the scripture is on my computer. I have the thing on my computer. I read it on my Bible. Um, but I highlight when I'm done with that day. I, I, have, I mean, I'm, I'm a checklist guy. I just, I, you know, I'm 51. I'm, I'm over trying to change. So I'm a checklist guy, which is whatever. But um, I just check, I have to check it off. And it's not like checking off a box, but I just have to know that I've, I've you know, accomplished that for the day. I've accomplished that for the day. That's how the thing. That's what I do. Listen. When I, when I, I think I've said this to you before, when I pray through the, the spiritual armor of God, you know, it talks about the last part. It's really the, the, the one defense, or the one offensive weapon that we have, the sword of the spirit. And um, when, I, when I pray that, my prayer for that is, I, I want, Lord, I, I give me just a desire and a love to know your word. Because I don't know your word like I, like I want to. Give me a desire to study and know your word. I want you to make that commitment that I'll be rooted in God's word. So that when difficulties come, and they will come, and they have come, and they'll continue to come. You'll be rooted in God's work. And it doesn't mean the difficulty will be easier, but it means that you'll have a way of walking through that difficulty because God's work give us guidance.